Uh, thank you for coming today. Uh, this, I believe, will be a very special performance of Stockhausen's mantra. My name is Timothy Koft. I'm an associate professor here at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And uh, I wanted to give uh, just a short pre-concert uh, talk about this piece. Just a few uh, pointers of perhaps how to listen to this piece, um, how the piece is made, and uh, just, just a few ideas I have about it that are not necessarily in line with what the composer was thinking, but it's just uh, some, a few thoughts I have about it, and it's just merely a suggestion of how you can listen to it. So this piece was composed in uh, 1969 and 1970, um, and uh, it was premiered in 1970 as well. And uh, Schockhausen was uh, one of the disciples of the Second Viennese School, um, so many of his pieces were uh, based off of twelve-tone rows, and they were serialistic in nature. And uh, this piece is one of those. So if you look at this handout that I hope you got when you came in, uh, on one side you see uh, the the formula of mantra, and I'm going to go through this formula because it is. The, uh, the, the kernel for the whole piece. Um, it begins with, um, well, it's based off of this row, starting on the A, up to B, up to G sharp, down to E. That's the first measure. Then on measure three, you see F and D. Those are the next two notes of the row. And then a measure of rest. And then on the second system, G, down to E flat, D flat, C, measure of rest. And then the final measure, B flat, G flat, A natural. And that's the row that it uses. And notice that it begins and ends on the A. So it's actually a 13 note row, not a 12 tone uh, row. row. Um, now, in addition to that, you'll see he takes some liberties and he will repeat certain notes. So the first one he repeats four times. The D twice. And then a little turn around the E. And then the F and the D he repeats back and forth like a slow tremolo. And then the G he plays twice. Tied to 
a dotted half note. So there's four beats. So three and four, it's irregular. And this idea becomes expanded into the idea of a Morris code, which you will hear all throughout the piece. Both pianists will be imitating a Morris code effect all the way through. And then at one point, you're even going to hear a Morris code through the electronics. Okay, and then the next one, trill. Then sforzando. And then the final note is with an arpeggio at the left hand. So those are the 12, excuse me, 13 ideas. Yeah, 13 ideas that the piece is based upon. And then if you look at the mantra a little bit closer, you'll notice that uh, he has certain rhythmic and, and mathematical uh, uh, ideas in it. The first idea is, the first A is take up one beat, and the next idea takes up two beats, the third one takes three beats, then four beats. One, two, three, four. And you add that up and you get ten. And then the next bar, you have three, three, three uh, beats of rest. And then if you look two bars later, you'll have two beats of rest. And then in the next system, one bar, one beat of rest, and then uh, four beats of rest. So you have one, two, three, four. I won't go through all of that, but you can look at it and, and find out the little mathematical formula that he's created. And then uh, I have only been playing the main uh, row, but this mantra is actually made up of two voices. So at the beginning, we have both hands playing. And you notice the left hand. That's the same thing as the right hand in, the, in bar three. So he's reusing the same material. And then if you look at bar three, the left hand. That is actually bar one, the right hand, in inversion. A, B, then up a sixth, to G sharp. In this case, it's A, down a step, down a sixth, to B flat. And then if you look at the next system, it's kind of hard to see in your piano, but the left hand, you have A flat, C, A natural. And if you look at the final bar in the right hand, you have B flat, G flat, A. Those are inversions of each other. And likewise, if you take bar three in the right hand, Instead, he, he used the pitches, but he also uses articulations, and he puts it in two voices, and there's already counterpoint right from the very beginning. And this is what he called his formula, which later uh, in his operas um, became a super formula, where he had basically three formulas on top of each other, which was the basis of his entire opera. And um, what he says, uh, and you have a quote, at the beginning of, uh, on, the, on your uh, handout here, uh, the program, excuse me. And I'll, I'll just read this quote. Stockhausen said, to say it is simply as possible, mantra as it stands is a miniature of the way a galaxy is composed. When I was composing this work, I had no accessory feelings or thoughts. I knew only that I had to fulfill the mantra. And it demanded itself, it, was, it just started blossoming. As it was being constructed through me, I somehow felt that it must be a very true picture of the way the cosmos is constructed. I've never worked on a piece before in which I was so sure that every note I was putting down was right. And this was due to the integral systemization. 
the combination of the scalar idea with the idea of deriving everything from the one, it shines very strongly. And there is also a, uh, a lecture you can find on YouTube where he uh, speaks to a group of uh, college students at the Imperial College of London. And if you're interested in this, I would definitely uh, recommend watching this. And he goes into great detail about how he takes this mantra and how it expands upon the piece. And I'll try to sum it up in about five minutes. <laughs> Basically what he does is he takes those 12 ideas, regular repetition, accent at the end, normal sound, a turn around a central pitch, and each one of those ideas becomes expanded into an entire section of the piece. And so the way he describes it, it's, 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 he says it's kind of like you're looking at a galaxy and then you have individual stars. The individual stars are the notes, but when you put them together, you get a galaxy. And so each one of these cycles is like a different galaxy, if you will. Um, so the first one, uh, you'll see in your program, I have the 13 cycles listed. There's the introduction and the formula or the mantra at the very beginning. And then there's regular repetitions where that idea is expanded. And then accents at the ends of pitches, normal sound, turns around a central pitch, etc. And in total, you have 13 cycles based off of those 13 articulations that come from the mantra, plus an introduction and coda at the end. And so while I was thinking about this, it reminded me of a piece that is very familiar to me and I'm sure very familiar to many of you. It reminded me a lot of Box Goldberg variations, actually. And on the flip side of your handout, you can see that I, um, I printed out the aria to the Goldberg variations of Bach. And Bach does something very similar. Uh, and if you know this piece well, you'll know exactly what I'm about to say. The aria is 32 bars long. And the piece itself is 30 variations plus an aria at the beginning and the end, so that's 30 plus two. And that's not a coincidence that there's 32 bars in the aria and 32, 30 variations plus the two arias. And um, he, he has a number of other mathematical ideas in the piece as well. Um, for example, every third variation is a canon. The first canon is at the unison. The second canon is at the second. The third canon is at the third, at the fourth, at the fifth, etc. And uh, much has been written about that, about the mathematical relationships and how the structure of Box Goldberg variations works. Um, the pianist Murray Pariah, who recorded the Goldberg variations, uh, took it a, a, a step further. Um, he writes about this in his liner notes to a CD, and I think it's a very, very um, a, a worthy interpretation of the piece. He said, not only do you have uh, three, uh, uh, every third variation is a canon, he said there's also a structural point in the middle of the piece, in variation uh, 15, where you have the French overture. <laughs> Every single variation felt like it was sort of an outgrowth of the, of the last one. But then at that point, it really does feel like you're starting anew, like it's a new beginning, and it's the midway point of the piece. And then he makes another uh, uh, startling um, discovery, as he looks at the aria itself, and he notices when Bach modulates to E minor. It's in the second half of the piece. Um, Excuse me, measure 25 is where he modulates to A minor. 
If you look at variation 25 of the set, it's the most striking variation of the entire piece. Um, this is alles nicht stretch, 
which translates to, it's not all that tragic. <laughs> and it's, uh, I, I'm not sure why the words are there. In no recordings does anyone speak it or sing it. They're just there. Yeah. And the next measure he writes under the tempo marking with humor. And so there are a lot of humorous moments in this piece as well. It's not all so serious and strictly composed. And so I, I think perhaps that's a key to both Bach's Goldberg variations and Stockhausen's mantra, is that not only is it a very serious, very long piece, oh, they're both about the same length as well. They're both around seven minutes. They're not only both very long and serious pieces, but there's also a, a humorous element and sort of a down-to-earth down quality of both pieces. So I just offer that as one way that you could possibly listen to this piece. Um, I didn't even talk about the electronics. Uh, this, this piece will use a, a ring modulator, which will distort the sound, and uh, percussion as well, and a few other surprises. Um, so with that, uh, I would like to uh, conclude uh, my lecture. I would like to thank a few people who have made this project possible. Uh, the first person is uh, Sam Friend, who has been in charge of all of the electronics. He's been teaching me about ring modulators and, and how all of this stuff works, and I could not have done this without him. He set up all the electronics for us. Um, the next person is Joan Aretta, my student. charge of the performance of the electronics, varying the uh, ring modulator and the volume of it. Uh, Tim Jones, who has been very gracious to help us uh, uh, with the percussion and allowing us to borrow it for a few days. And um, who else do I need to thank? Uh, Jennifer Beller, um, the organizer of Next Tech Music Series, for um, allowing us to do this. And uh, last but not least, my duo partner, who's backstage, Katie Leon, who has uh, done such an amazing job preparing this piece, and just we've put in countless hours to make this all happen. And uh, I'm very grateful because uh, it's it's not uh, it's, it's not very common to hear music like this being performed because it requires so many people uh, involved. Um, and, uh, but last but not least, you have to have a second pianist who's also willing to put in the time and energy. So, uh, I'm very grateful for her as well. And with that, I need to take a five minute break. <laughs> I will go backstage and in about five minutes, we will begin the performance. Thank you.
Thank you.